Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. If you are an old time subscriber, I thank you for watching this video. So this video is a little different, but it is um, along the lines of my um, journey to peace with my physical appearance, okay? So in this video, I'm going to talk to you about my experience with a DNC. Um, it was something that I originally was not going to share on this channel, um, but it was something I decided to go ahead and do after I did some research and I couldn't find exactly what it was that I was looking for. So what I've seen so far is in regard to women having miscarriages and that is what led them to having a DNC. Well, I did not have a miscarriage. I have is PCOS and that causes its own problems. So some of those problems um, cause me to not ovulate, which means that when I don't ovulate every month, I don't shed my lining all the way. So I have now what's called a complex dig in endometrium. Well, how did I get there? Let me back up, let me tell you the story. All right, so I began my cycle when I was nine, right? Nine. Who wants to have a period of nine? Like I didn't. And, um, you know, it made for some rough summers because back then they didn't tell me what was wrong with me. Um, but I had irregular cycles. And what that meant for me and what that looked like for me was my period would come on when it felt like it and it would go off when it felt like it. Was there were times where my period came on and stayed on for months. Months. Like three months um, are you done are, are you done yeah can i are you done are you done okay um and then it would go off and it would stay off for that same time period and then come back on um and it was so irregular but when i was bleeding i was bleeding heavily um, like I would soak a pad and have to change every hour. I had to have a doctor's note to go to school so that the teachers would let me go to the bathroom every hour. Um, because you know, in middle school, teachers think that you're playing around in the hallway. You don't really have to go to the bathroom that much, but I did and I needed to. Um, so that's what I had to do. Um, and when I was 10, my doctor recommended to my mom that she get me a DNC to try and slow the bleeding down a little bit. And then they put me on birth control. Uh, and I was on birth control from the time that I was 10 until I was um, probably about 19 or 20. Um, and when I got off of the birth control in college, it was because I had a cyst that ruptured and it was incredibly painful. Um, I was in the middle of a workout um, because I ran track when I was in college. So I was in the middle of a workout and just doubled over on the ground in pain, in tears. And um, I went to the emergency room and that's when I found out that a cyst had ruptured. So the doctor told me to stop taking my birth control. And he said that because I had been on the pill for so long that it would be in my, my system for about six months. And, um, and then it would come out and then I wouldn't have to worry about getting pregnant during that time period because I had been on birth control. And previous to that, the doctors had always told me that because of my irregular cycle, it would be very difficult for me to get pregnant anyway. Um, now, what they don't tell you is that when you come off of any form of birth control, you are fertile myrtle. Okay, so um, nobody told me this. So I went with what the doctor said. Six months, it'll be out of my system, right? Baby, I was pregnant in two weeks. What? What? Two weeks. That's how my first daughter got here. Um, so I was 19, 20 when I got pregnant with her. And after her, uh, my cycle started to regulate itself because I didn't want to go on any form of birth control for a little while. Um, and then I went back to the pill and I didn't like that. So I got off of it. And when my husband and I got married and we started to try for um, another baby, the doctor told me then, then um, I was probably about 26 maybe, um, that I had what was PCOS and that he needed to put me on birth control, number one. And number two, he needed me to lose some weight. 
the other symptom of PCOS is that it's very difficult for you to lose weight. Um, so he said he needed me to try as hard as I could. So during that time period, he put me on for three months. During that time period, I lost about 20 pounds and I got off and immediately he told me to try the Clear Blue Easy, um, the Happy Face test, the ovulation kit. And so that's what I did and I got pregnant the first round. Um, and then I got off of it. Um, after her, I did not go on another birth control. Um, but I was nursing and my doctor didn't tell me that the nursing uh, helps to trigger ovulation because a part of PCOS means that you don't ovulate every month um, on your own. So the nursing helped to trigger, trigger um, the ovulation. There came my son, my surprise baby. Um, so he was my last one. So what led me to the doctor this time uh, nearly four years after having my son, not being on any form of birth control, um, not being careful, really. Uh, like our, Don't judge me. But our birth control method right now has been, Jesus touched and agreed with us when we said that we were done. Like, okay. <laughs> um, I know how, how silly it sounds because we both are grown and we know um, that there are some contraceptives uh, on this planet for us to use, but I don't want to be on any form of birth control. And that's what we've done. Um, but really all it is, is I don't ovulate. So um, we're not really gambling. <laughs> um, so I went to the doctor because I started to have pain during sex and I started to bleed. Um, and this had gone on for a little while, like it was spotting. And so I didn't really consider it to be a problem until one time. One time we had sex and it's like the blood just looked like a cycle. And I knew that I wasn't due for my cycle for a while, but like this was, it was dark. It was a lot. So I said, you know, I need to go to the doctor. Before, before I get to the doctor, I searched Dr. Google. Okay. So Dr. Google scared the bejesus out of me because Dr. Google told me that either I had cancer or my husband was cheating on me and I had contracted an STD. Now Google said a couple more things, but those are what stuck out to me. So the entire time I'm leading up to the doctor's appointment, I am stressing out because either I have cancer and I'm about to die or my husband is cheating on me and um, we got some other problems. Um, so I get to the doctor and he says, well, you're too young for cancer. Um, you're only 33 and uterine cancer or endometrial cancer uh, typically comes in postmenopausal women. And then he remembers that I started my cycle at nine. He says, okay, well, we do need to rule it out. So what we're gonna do is a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, and because I produce too much estrogen and the progesterone hormone doesn't come through monthly to shed the lining, that's how I get this buildup of my endometrium. So I took some notes, let me tell you about it. So um, one of the common risk factors for having um, this um, hyperplasia is being over 35, I'm not, I'm 33, being white, I'm not, um, starting a period early or menopause late. Well, I started my period when I was nine, so I think that's pretty early. Um, obesity, um, larger than I should be. I'm about 40 pounds heavier than um, I'm supposed to be. So that counts as being obese because my body mass index is about 30, 30 to 35%. Cigarette smoker, I don't smoke. Um, a family history of uterine, colon, or ovarian cancer. I found out from my dad that there is a history of ovarian cancer on his side of the family and a personal history of diabetes, PCOS, gallbladder disease, or thyroid disease. And um, I do have PCOS. So of the seven factors, I have four of the risk factors for um, the hyperplasia. So they schedule my appointment. They give me um, a phone call a couple days before the appointment, and she tells me that I need to be at the surgery center by 6 a.m. for my 7.30 a.m. procedure. Um, I, by now, I have already Googled the procedure. I have watched 
a real woman get this procedure done and I'm feeling mm, a little nervous, a little anxious, but I get there, I sign in, I get all the insurance information stuff together. And then I um, go into the back a little while later and when I get in the back, they wanna make sure that I know why I'm there. So they ask me questions about the procedure that I'm about to get. Um, they ask me the, my doctor's name. They get all of my identifying information. Um, and then they make me do a urine sample. They want to make sure that I'm not pregnant before they do this procedure. Um, and then the anesthesiologist, she came and she talked to me. And she told me about everything that she was going to do. My husband came in. He... Um, was able to sit with me for just a little while. The doctor came in and explained the procedure again to him. And then they rolled me into the room where the procedure is going to happen. So in this room, it's very sterile. There are a couple more people in there that didn't introduce themselves. Um, I just knew that they were a part of the team because they had on the medical gear. Um, but they rolled me in on the bed and then they switched me from the bed that I came in on into the bed that they were going to do the procedure on um and i remember the anesthesiologist was at my head and she said i am going to put some medicine in your iv um it's just going to loosen you up a little bit uh, don't be alarmed if you feel drowsy and so i remember that and then i remember saying i have to go to the bathroom and i remember this lady saying oh, okay it'll be all right um and then the next thing i remember is this lady saying i'm gonna put this oxygen mask on your face it's just oxygen so breathe in and breathe out that is the last thing I remember. Um, and then I woke up. And I woke up in a different room. My husband was there. The nurse was there. And they were both laughing. Um, I found out later that they were laughing at me because I kept going in and out of sleep. Like the lady would ask me a question. I would start to answer. And then and she, I wake up and she asked me a question. And I, so they had to keep me there for a little bit longer until they were certain that I could stay awake for a while. Um, so afterward, how did I feel? Um, my husband said the procedure took all of 15 minutes. Um, I didn't feel any pain or anything like that. Um, so day one after the procedure, because it was so early, we just went home and I got in the bed and I slept. Like that was some of the best sleep I have ever had um i just slept and i kept dozing in and out so by the time we got home it was probably 10 a.m i slept until three uh, when i woke up i went out into the family room to look for my husband and he was asleep i was going to tell him that i was hungry but because he was asleep i just got back in the bed and i went back to sleep um our children were with my mother-in-law and she was just letting me rest um, and so by the time I woke up again, it was eight that night. So we got up, we went to go and get our children, um, and then we came back home and I went back to bed. I think I ate a piece of chicken, but that was pretty much all I ate that day. And on day one, I was, I was okay. So day two, um, was pretty much more of the same on day two I was a little bit more crampy than I was on day one but I told my husband that um, if this makes sense my my uterus my the bottom part of my stomach felt lighter so a, a, the normal range for a woman's uterine lining is during her cycle it's about one to four millimeters thick um, and at most during that 28 day cycle period, it gets up to 16 millimeters. Mine was 30, double, more than double the thickest part, um, portion uh, during the cycle. And my doctor said that mine was the thickest he had ever seen. And um, he said that was why it always felt so weighty down there for me. So, um, I felt lighter on day two, but I was still a little bit crampy. Um, I put some notes, so that's why you see me looking down. But I stayed home, I rested, um, I wasn't in you know a terrible amount of pain. So on day three, I went to work uh, because he said that I should be fine to do that by then. I went to work and for the most part, I was okay until the very end of the day. And at the end of the day, I started to have some cramps and then I had this one cramp 
that felt like a labor contraction. And in labor, you have contractions, they let up, you get a breather, get another contraction, it lets up, you get a breather. But this one was a consistent pain, a consistent dull pain in the beginning, and then it was a consistent sharp pain. Um, and it was so painful that I could do nothing but cry. I was too far away from my desk to email anybody to come and assist me. Um, but my phone was in my lap. So I called my husband in tears saying that I couldn't move. Like I was stuck. I could not get up. I couldn't um, get my feet on the ground to push the chair a little bit closer. Like I couldn't do anything. But one of my coworkers came into my office and she ended up bringing me some Advil. So that lessened the pain for me enough to go home. And um, when I got home, I just rested for the rest of the day. So day four um, rolled around and I had to take the kids to this church event. So my husband and I went and I was feeling a little bit better, but, um, you know, not much better. And by day four, I started to have some more cramps in my stomach, but these cramps were different. So these cramps felt like gas bubbles. Um, and it felt like, I, you know, you, when you're constipated, but you have to go and then like it can't come out. That's what it felt like. Um, I learned from my sister that this is what it felt like when uh, she had her cesarean sections. I had all vaginal birth, so I didn't experience this, that feeling um, of having to go or having to pass gas and, and you can't. Um, and she said, you know, that that's something you have to do before you leave the hospital, that you have to pass gas or poop before um, they let you out. Well, I couldn't, and I was in pain. Like, I couldn't walk. <laughs> um, it was painful to walk. Um, I really couldn't move, so I... <laughs> I sat in my home and I put my, like I got on the ground, I put my head down. So this is my head. My head was like this and this is my butt. And I, this is how I, um, I positioned myself on the ground to try and get the gas to move a little bit. I also drank um, hot water with lemon. I gulped that down. I drank two cups of detox tea to try and get things moving. Nothing. Um, so that was day four. Day five was more of the same. Um, but by the end of day five, I was finally able to pass gas. Listen, I have never wanted to pass gas so badly in my life. Um, and when I finally did, oh boy, did the smell was not nice. <laughs> not nice. Um, but by the end of it, after I had passed gas, it felt good. Like I, my stomach started to feel better. So on day six, the doctor told me that I was safe to travel. And so I had to travel out of town for work. Um, the cramps were less, but the bleeding started to increase. Um, and But day six was pretty uneventful. So day seven rolled around and day seven was yesterday. So day seven rolls around and I noticed that although my cramps are gone, my bleeding has increased and the color of the blood has changed. And so now it looks like regular cycle blood, um, which is strange to me. Why? Because everything I had read up until this point says that women typically don't get a normal cycle for two or three months after this procedure. Bruh. I got seven days. Um, now, mind you, this is the time that my cycle is supposed to come on anyway. Um, but I thought that I would get a break. Um, no. Um, so I have my cycle. And it is on right now. But it's very, it is so much lighter than normal. Also, a part of this is... Um, heavy cycles. So um, the doctor said that this should ease up my cycles a bit. This should um, stop the bleeding during sex and it should stop the pain that's also associated with sex. Um, right now he wants to treat me for the thickened endometrium with uh, an IUD because he said that that would be the best thing to do to kind of even out my um, my levels. But I, I've been pushing back on the IUD because I really didn't want any hormones or extra hormones in my body. Um, 
you guys tell me down in the comment section whether you think that that's something that I should consider, um, the IED, whatever your experiences are with it, and if you think it'll help, um, because he's really pushing me toward that. So now I did some research on ways that I could handle this naturally or ways to try and alleviate some of the problems naturally through my diet. And so um, what I've read it kind of contradicts itself just a little and so I need to discuss it with my doctor. So it says that I should avoid dairy, that I should avoid gluten, um, that I should um, avoid caffeine and that I should eat as organic as possible and I, I should also avoid fatty foods. Now where the contradiction comes in um, is because I also have PCS and so for PCOS that um, is recommended that you do a ketogenic diet. So the ketogenic diet is high in fat, um, low in carbs, moderate protein. So how am I supposed to avoid fatty foods and do a ketogenic diet? I'm not sure. Um, and I like the ketogenic diet because I like cheese and I can have cheese on that diet. Now y'all tell me I can't have dairy. And I love my coffee like every morning. So I'm going to have to find me um, a tea, I guess, that'll work. Um, we'll see. But this is week one and this is how I was feeling after week one. You guys let me know down below if you want me to do another upload for week two of how I'm feeling post the DNC. Um, and I'll do that for you. And in July, on July 14th, I will be starting the um, the Lift 4 program. So I'll be coming on again um, back into my exercise routine. But in the interim, I'm going to work on the dietary restrictions and see, you know, what that does. I also have to go to the doctor next week and next week he'll give me the results of the biopsy. And I am praying that it is not endometrium cancer or any other form of cancer. Um, and I'll keep you guys posted on that if that's something that you're interested in. Um, until next time, journey on.